multiple incidences, including right before the Secretary of Commerce's visit to, to China. Our critical infrastructure is also under attack. This year's annual threat assessment of the United States intelligence community highlighted the threat that adversarial cyber actors pose to our critical infrastructure owners and operators. DHS, CISA, and the FBI have a crucial role to play in supporting these owners and operators to defend against and respond to these threats. Finally, we must address the challenge posed by the CCP. Against the backdrop of all these threats lie the specter of a regime that continues to challenge the United States economically, technologically, diplomatically, and militarily. Through its relentless espionage, the CCP is stealing U.S. intellectual property, trade secrets, and other sensitive data of Americans and American companies. Over the past year alone, the CCP has increased its espionage efforts against the homeland in a variety of ways. These include the CCP's surveillance balloon, collecting intelligence on sensitive sites, and Chinese nationals posing as tourists to access our military installations and other sensitive sites. And Chinese nationals who have crossed our southern border at unprecedented levels. 24,000 apprehensions of Chinese nationals at the southwest border in FY 2023 alone, a 1,100% increase from last year. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see there's intentionality there. If recent reports are correct, the CCP also operates dozens of overseas police stations, which aid their transnational repression effort by intimidating and threatening Chinese dissidents abroad. DHS and the FBI must ensure that transnational repression tactics and schemes by foreign governments cannot continue on American soil, and we stand ready to help. The CCP has also made strides in infiltrating our nation's education system. It should concern every American that billions of dollars from the CCP are flowing into our K-12 classrooms and institutions of higher education. This is a systematic effort by the CCP to expand its influence within America's classrooms and promote its authoritarian and anti-American agenda. So what is the Homeland Security Committee doing about these threats? Well, first in May, we passed H.R. 2, the Secure the Border Act, the most comprehensive border security legislation in decades. We have addressed cyber threats head on through a whole of nation approach. We've passed legislation encountering responsible use, encouraging responsible use of open source software in the federal government and building DHS's cyber workforce. I've convened a group of committees across Congress to discuss and develop solutions to this problem that implicate multiple committees of jurisdiction. Just last week, this committee advanced Congressman Pfluger's legislation to prohibit D DHS funds from flowing into universities that host Confucius Institutes and Chinese entities of concern. Further, we passed Congressman Guest's common sense legislation to counter the CCP's brazen espionage and theft of U.S. innovation by barring DHS from purchasing drones from the PRC or other foreign adversaries. We have held multiple hearings to examine the evolving threat of terrorism more than two decades after September the 11th and their implications on the homeland, including a recent hearing where we received confirmation of the immediate and significant threat the Iranian regime poses to the United States homeland. This committee has also deemed demanded information on individuals from Uzbekistan and other countries who used a smuggler with ties to ISIS to enter the United States through our southwest border. We also demanded information on DHS's screening and vetting of Afghan evacuees in the wake of our catastrophic withdrawal. Most recently, we've requested documents and information from both DHS and the FBI on terrorist threats at the southwest border. The department and FBI's delays and lack of responsiveness have become an unacceptable pattern. Make no mistake, we will continue to use every tool at our disposal to secure these answers for the American people. I look forward to a productive conversation about the current threats to our homeland and the actions being taken to prevent them. I thank our witnesses for being here, and I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning and welcome to our witnesses, Secretary Mayorkas, Director Ray, and Director Abizade. Uh, we welcome you. With one notable exception, during the prior administration, you and your predecessors have regularly come before this committee to discuss security threats facing the homeland and how your department and agencies are keeping our country safe. 
Thank you for being here today and for your service. And please convey our thanks to the dedicated public servants who work for you and for all of us every day. This worldwide threats hearing takes place with a war going on in the Middle East, persistent threats from foreign terrorist organization and domestic violent extremists, and surging anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We are seeing more sophisticated cyber attacks, unprecedented global migration, and have a presidential election less than a year away. The list of issues critical to the homeland goes on. My Democratic colleagues and I plan to ask you about these issues, and we stand ready and willing, as always, to work with you to address these challenges on behalf of the American people. Unfortunately, my Republican colleagues have a different agenda today, and we need to be clear about what their agenda really means from the outset of this hearing. Republicans are directly politically motivated attacks at administration witnesses and they are doing so to distract from the Republicans' own failures at governing. They are infighting, and their support for a Republican presidential candidate who is himself a threat to democracy. That's what some people in Washington do rather than take responsibility for their own failures. And to be sure, Republicans have failed at running the House of Representatives. They ousted their own speaker paralyzing the House and bringing the legislative process to a standstill for weeks as they fought among themselves. They can't manage to pass bills to fund the government. Instead, they have abruptly pulled spending bills from the House floor and have gone from near shutdown to near shutdown despite the harm it caused to our government, our economy, and our security. They appear on TV to rant about border security, and they issue bogus so-called reports replete with false statements and racist rhetoric about the border. Other complain about bookstores refusing to sell their propaganda. But when it comes to actually paying for border security personnel and resources or passing legitimate border security legislation, they are AWOL. They talk tough about strengthening our cyber defenses, but then vote to slash funding for the agency charged with that important mission. They reveal their presidential candidate, who admires dictators and despots, calling them capable, competent, and smart, who recently refer referred to his political opponents as vermin and threatened to use the Justice Department against them. Who talks about erecting, quote, detention camps, unquote, on United States soil. Republicans don't want to own up to it or deal with any of that. So rather than getting their own house in order, they direct baseless attacks at the administration and Secretary Mayorkas in particular. We know their extreme mega members are desperate to impeach someone, anyone at all. They're on a crusade to impeach the Secretary although there's zero justification for it. Unlike the Trump administration, the Biden administration has followed the law on border security and immigration. Claiming asylum at the border is lawful. If my Republican colleagues don't like the law, well, they're in the majority. Try to change it. The prior administration also refused to provide information sought by Congress in more than 100 congressional inquiries, but this administration has been and continues to be responsive to Congress. It is my understanding today's hearing is Secretary Mayorkas' 27th time testifying before Congress is being confirmed as Secretary. Under his leadership, DHS has responded to more than 1,400 congressional letters and produce more than 11,000 pages of documents to this committee alone. Secretary Mayorkas is carrying out his responsibilities as Secretary of Homeland Security, but Republicans don't like this administration's policies. Cabinet secretaries shouldn't be impeached over policy differences. That's not what the Constitution says. That's not what the founders intended. They certainly shouldn't be impeached to distract from Republican failures 
or to appease the extreme mega element that has overtaken their party. Rather than this impeachment distraction, we should be focused on how Congress and administration can work together to secure the homeland. That's what this committee has done since its inception. That's what we were sent here to do. And that's what the American people expect of us. It's a shame my Republican colleagues are working their own agenda instead because of this committee and this Congress and our homeland suffers because of it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. And I'm pleased to have an important uh, panel of witnesses before us today. And I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. You may be seated. I would now like to formally introduce our witnesses. The Honorable Alejandro Mayorkas was sworn in as Secretary of Department of Homeland Security by President Biden on February the 2nd of 2021. Mr. Mayorkas has had a 30-year career as a law enforcement official and a lawyer in the private sector. From 2013 to 2016, he served as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and as the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services from 2009 to 2013. The Honorable Christopher Wray became the eighth director of the FBI. On August the 2nd, 2017, Mr. Wray started his law enforcement career in 1997 serving in the Department of Justice as an Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. The Honorable Christine Abizade was sworn in as the Director of National Counterterrorism Center on June 29th of 2021. She is the eighth Senate-confirmed director and the first woman to lead the United States counterterrorism enterprise. Previously, she served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. I thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I now recognize Secretary Mayorkas for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, distinguished members of this committee. In September, the Department of Homeland Security published the 2024 Homeland Threat Assessment, laying out the most direct, pressing threats to our security. Already, in the weeks since the assessment was published, the world has changed. Hamas terrorists horrifically attacked thousands of innocent men, women, and children in Israel on October 7, brutally murdering, wounding, and taking hostages of all ages. In the days and weeks since, we have responded to an increase in threats against Jewish, Muslim, and Arab American communities and institutions across our country. Hate directed at Jewish students, communities, and institutions add to a pre-existing increase in the level of anti-Semitism in the United States and around the world. As the last month has shown, the threat environment our department is charged with confronting has evolved and expanded constantly in the 20 years since our founding after 9-11. Today, individuals radicalized to violence can terrorize using a vehicle or a firearm. A transnational criminal organization needs only to conceal 2.2 pounds of fentanyl in a commercial truck or passenger car crossing through our land port of entry to kill as many as half a million people. Lone actors in nation states such as Russia, Iran, North Korea, and the People's Republic of China can use computer code to steal sensitive personal information, shut down critical infrastructure, and extort millions in ransom payments. Compromising deep fake images can exploit and ruin the life of a young person. Extreme heat, wildfires, and devastating hurricanes are increasing in frequency and severity. And our department's founding rationale, the threat posed by foreign terrorists using weapons of mass destruction, remains. The 260,000 men and women of the Department of Homeland Security work every day to mitigate these threats and many more. I am immensely proud to be here today on their behalf to discuss the work they do, the challenges they face, and most importantly, the support they require from Congress to do their jobs. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. I would like to focus today on two such means of critical, urgent support. First, 
Congress must now not allow key DHS authorities to lapse. Our department's authority to implement the chemical facility anti-terrorism standards expired on Jan July 28th. That means the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is barred from inspecting over 3,000 high-risk chemical facilities, including one in Shepherd, Texas, where an explosion last week forced nearby communities to shelter in place for hours. We are also barred from identifying who is accessing them and whether they are stockpiling dangerous chemicals. Historically, more than a third of inspections identify at least one gap in a facility's security. Our counter drone authority will expire on Saturday, challenging among other missions, the Secret Service's ability to protect the president and vice president and Customs and Border Protection's ability to patrol the Southwest border and intercept cartel drones ferrying drugs and other contraband through the air. Our weapons, our department's Office of Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Authority will expire on December 21. That would hinder our ability to detect biological and illicit nuclear material threats and safeguard against the use of AI in the development of biological weapons as President Biden charged us with doing last month in his executive order on artificial intelligence. Finally, key elements of our intelligence collection authority under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act will expire on December 31. Expiration would leave our country vulnerable to attacks supported by American citizens, and it would cripple our ability to identify and secure American citizens who are the targets of such attacks. Renewing each of these four authorities is common sense, bipartisan, and critical to our national security. This is not a moment to let our guard down. Second, we need Congress to allocate sufficient resources to enable our nation's frontline officers to carry out their difficult jobs and keep the American people safe. Last month, our administration requested critical supplemental homeland security funding that would help us do just that. This funding package would allow us to more effectively combat the scourge of fentanyl, stem the impacts of historic migration, and accelerate work authorization for eligible non-citizens. This funding will, in short, make a critical difference in our department's operational capacity and in our national security. Ensuring the safety of the American people is a national imperative and a governmental obligation. I look forward to partnering with Congress to deliver for the men and women who keep our country safe. I look forward to working with you to address the threats and challenges America faces today and in the years to come. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas. I now recognize Director Ray for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Green, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee. It's been more than five weeks since Hamas terrorists carried out their brutal attacks against innocent Israelis, dozens of American citizens, and others from around the world. And our collective efforts remain on supporting our partners overseas and seeking the safe return of the hostages. But this hearing, well, focused on threats to our homeland, is well-timed given the dangerous implications the fluid situation in the Middle East has for our homeland security. In a year where the terrorism threat was already elevated, the ongoing war in the Middle East has raised the threat of an attack against Americans in the United States to a whole nother level. Since October 7th, we've seen a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations call for attacks against Americans and our allies. Hezbollah expressed its support and praise for Hamas and threatened to attack U.S. interests in the Middle East. Al-Qaeda issued its most specific call to attack the United States in the past five years. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula called on jihadists to attack Americans and Jewish people everywhere. ISIS urged its followers to target Jewish communities in the United States and Europe. Given those calls for action, our most immediate concern is that individuals or small groups will draw twisted inspiration from the events in the Middle East to carry out attacks here at home. That includes homegrown violent extremists inspired by a foreign terrorist organization and domestic violent extremists targeting Jewish Americans or other faith communities like Muslim Americans. Across the country, the FBI has been aggressively countering violence by extremists 
citing the ongoing conflict as inspiration. In Houston, we arrested a guy who'd been studying bomb making and posted about killing Jewish people. Outside Chicago, we've got a federal hate crime investigation into the killing of a six-year-old Muslim boy. At Cornell University, we arrested a man who threatened to kill members of that university's Jewish community. And in Los Angeles, we arrested a man for threatening the CEO and other members of the Anti-Defamation League. And I could go on. On top of the so-called lone actor threat, we cannot and do not discount the possibility that Hamas or another foreign terrorist organization may exploit the current conflict to conduct attacks here on our own soil. We have kept our sights on Hamas and have multiple investigations into individuals affiliated with that foreign terrorist organization. And while historically our Hamas cases have identified individuals here who are facilitating and financing terrorism overseas, we continue to scrutinize our intelligence to assess how that threat may be evolving. But it's not just Hamas. As I highlighted for this committee in my testimony last year, Iran, the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism, has directly or by hiring criminals mounted assassination attempts against dissidents and high-ranking current and former U.S. officials, including right here on American soil. Or take Hezbollah, Iran's primary strategic partner, which has a history of raising money and seeking to obtain weapons here in the United States. FBI arrests in recent years also indicate that Hezbollah has tried to seed operatives, establish infrastructure, and engage in spying here domestically, raising our concern that they may be contingency planning for future operations in the United States. And while we are not currently tracking a specific plot, given that disturbing history, we are keeping a close eye on what impact recent events may have on those terrorist groups intentions here in the United States and how those intentions might evolve. Now, I want to be clear, while this is certainly a time for heightened vigilance, it is by no means a time for panic. Americans should continue to be alert and careful, but they shouldn't stop going about their daily lives. All across the country, the FBI's men and women are working with urgency and purpose to confront the elevated threat. That means working closely with our federal, state, and local partners on our FBI-led Joint Terrorism Task Forces, taking an even closer look at existing investigations and canvassing sources to increase awareness across the board, and doing all we can, working with our partners to protect houses of worship here in the U.S. Bottom line, we're going to continue to do everything in our power to protect the American people and support our partners in Israel. Now, protecting Americans from the threat of terrorism is and remains our number one priority. But as you all know, the range of threats that we battle each and every day is enormous, from cyber attacks to economic espionage to violent crime and narcotics trafficking and everything in between. The problems we tackle aren't getting any easier. But we have continued to work to outpace our adversaries. We disrupted over 40 percent more cyber operations last year and arrested over 60% more cyber criminals than the year before. We've got easily 2,000 active investigations across all 56 field offices into China's relentless efforts to steal our innovation and intellectual property. And over the past two years alone, we've seized enough fentanyl to kill 270 million Americans. That's more than 80% of all Americans. Just this month, working with our partners, FBI Boston seized nearly 8 million doses of fentanyl and methamphetamine-laced pills and powder, including nearly 20 pounds of fentanyl-laced pills that had been pressed to look like heart-shaped candy. That's one of the largest single seizures in New England history and demonstrates the deadly reach of the cartels trafficking dangerous drugs to every corner of our nation. I am incredibly proud of the 38,000 skilled and dedicated professionals of the FBI who tackle all these complex challenges. And I think it is our shared responsibility to make sure that they've got the tools they need to keep all of us safe. Indispensable in that toolkit against 
foreign adversaries are the FBI's FISA 702 authorities. And I'm happy to talk about all the things the FBI has done over the past couple of years to make sure we're good stewards of our 702 authorities. But I can tell you, it would be absolutely devastating if the next time an adversary like Iran or China launches a major cyber attack, we don't see it coming because 702 was allowed to lapse. Or, or with the fast moving situation in the Middle East, just imagine if some foreign terrorist organization overseas shifts its intentions and directs an operative here who'd been contingency planning to carry out an attack in our own backyard. And imagine if we're not able to disrupt that threat because the FBI's 702 authorities have been so watered down. I want to close by thanking you for your continued support of the FBI's men and women who work tirelessly and selflessly to protect all Americans. And thank you for having me here today. I look forward to your question. Thank you.